I was a 4-H leader back about 14 years ago when my children were young, it became really apparent that this new plant moved into the valley and it was the Japanese knotweed. So that's really what I'm going to speak about. And we had a lot of fun with it and uh, actually adopted a plant. We called him Jordan. We grew him. We potted him. We wanted to see how big he could get. And then with children in particular, it was a great deal of fun to give them permission to then trash and kill this plant. And then how could we trash and kill this plant intentionally and, and with good reason? So we taught these youngsters what invasives were back when we're invasives were pretty new to the Olivaria Valley. The Olive River Valley runs, from my perspective, from Big Indian on up to the headwaters, which is out by Winnesook Lake. So it's about an eight mile stretch of river and road that wends its way side by side. And as really happens in the higher country in the Catskills, you have a very narrow corridor where you have all of that which we might consider municipal. We do have electrics, we have nice egg poles, and we have roads. And that's really about all that we have to offer that comes structurally to us but it all has to land in the very same narrow confines of these pretty narrow valleys. So when we have high water issues, as we now call them, we no longer call them floods apparently, <laughs> high water issues, it all floods. And we find that our riparian zone, while it seems kind of narrow, our water way is now quite broad. So anything that was in there is either washed down, and that which was above comes down to greet us. And while knotweed and most of these invasives didn't and don't live upstream of us, each time we have one of these flood events, we have to have a tremendous amount of repair done in the valley. And that repair means large boulders, rip rock, gabions, large trucks, heavy equipment. We lived with, as many of us did who lived here throughout the flood, a lot of the, you know, we had helicopters overhead and, and we had the Army Corps underfoot. And a lot of stuff was moving back and forth. And what was coming in each time particularly with Irene, was a lot of invasives. So as much as we were, at, in the heat of the moment, so grateful for all of this help, in the back of my mind and my kids' mind was, oh no, we're not what's going to move in. And sure enough, you can watch every single patch where we lost roads and embankments and culverts, where things blew out, you can now see where the knotweed has moved in. So what I had done many years ago when my children were young and they're now grown, we had at that time mapped out all of the knotweed that was in our valley and there was very little. It was predominantly in our own hollow and we actually knew the old German man who has now passed away who had brought it to our hollow as an ornamental. He was an incredible gardener and at that time it was considered something quite beautiful. And uh, we got rid of it in our little hollow. Well it all it came back in strong during Irene or after Irene. But we have started up on it again. Mm -hmm. And what has really worked in our valley is a matter of communicating with people, telling people what it's about, working with the various agencies, gotten a lot of support. And we've now teamed up hollow by hollow. And we've broken off into spring branches within the hollows to either map it and or start eradic eradicating it individually and on our own. There are different methods of eradication and these two young men are going to get into it. But my real message here is that it's doable, particularly in our valley, because it hasn't won yet. So we are tackling it, and I really believe that we will get rid of it and end up with isolated patches that we'll just be managing. So we are managing it, we are pulling it, we are digging it out. Some folks have gone to the next step and are, are using a chemical treatment on it. But I would say if you have an area that you feel that you've got an invasive, that you don't want, you recognize what it is and why it's not of value to you, I would say jump on it and team up with neighbors, try to get that energy going. And, um, and then if you need help, reach out to a broader, a broader area because people will step up and, and work on it together. And if you can then team up with the Ashokan people, with the Catskill Center folks, there are all kinds of organizations out there now who really are identifying invasives as a problem and uh, recognize that we can minimize them, at least manage them, if we can't actually eradicate. That's what we ought to be working on. So I, I sort of set this up as a challenge to you. Learn a few of them. Pick one that's really going to be, you know, something you can get passionate about, and then try to jump on it. And then team up with a few friends and neighbors and see if you can make this grow. And with that, I'll pass this on. All right.
I've been the Catsco Regional Invasive Species Partnership Coordinator for a little over a year. I started in February at the Catsco Center last year. And um, Zach and I, we might think that we work with plants and animals and we're, we're trying to address these invasive species uh, and we're trying to protect the beauty of the Catskills and the Adirondacks, which we are, but we're really working with people. We're working with you guys. And if you are passionate about invasive species and you join with other people that are passionate about them, then together we can really do something about invasive species. We can do something about them in our backyards and we can do something about them in our country because um, as uh, Dr. Uh, Donahue said this morning, uh, the, the world economy is global and that's why we have so many invasive species in New York State and we'll touch on that to some degree uh, in this talk. So we need to work locally and we need to think about globally what are the issues that are really affecting us and what can we do about it. So we're going to touch on that. Um, we're going to talk about what an invasive species is, uh, what the resources are, including the partner partnerships for re regional invasive species management, which um, we both are working in different programs of that. Uh, Zach will get into um, uh, invasive species management plans, and we'll talk about some of the invasive species uh, that we have that are well established in this region, like uh, the, the Japanese knotweed, and also ones that it would be great if you're looking for ones that riparian corridors, streams, uh, rivers are susceptible to, and uh, when you're working in your, your local stream, it would be good if you were aware of what species you should be looking for, and then you know how to identify them and also how to report them and, and who to let know or how you can report them yourself so that you can share that information with other people. So an invasive species uh, is a non-native species that can cause harm to the environment, the economy, or to human health. Invasives come from around the world, so the global economy makes this problem more of a challenge for us. As international trade increases, so does the rate of in invasive species introductions. Um, and ac actually, Dave mentioned the Asian longhorn beetle and how that is, a, is an issue or could be an issue uh, within the DEP properties and uh, could really kill a lot of the trees of the Catskill. So it's one species that we don't want to arrive in the Catskills region. Why are invasive species a threat? Because they degrade our habitats, uh, which may include the loss of a lot of our native species, our wildlife, our fish, our plants, uh, the loss of recreational opportunities and income, and also could cause crop damage, forest damage, diseases to humans and livestock. So they can affect the ecology, the economy, and human health of our region in the state of New York. And I think one of the reasons that New York State is a leader in invasive species management is because we have more forest pests than any other state in the country. Uh, if you look at this map, what it's showing here is a blow up of, of New York State that uh, New York State not only has more forest pests, but here in Ulster County, um, out of all the counties in New York, Ulster County ranks second in terms of forest pests that we have in this county. So because we're so close to the port of New York City, we are very susceptible to forest pests and any invasives that are brought into that port. They're within 100 miles of infecting our forest. So we have to be very vigilant about uh, what's coming in on the ships that are coming into New York City and what's coming out on a truck out in New York City. So I like to think of invasive species management um, along this framework of the invasion curve. Uh, so what the invasion curve is showing us is on the, the left hand axis, the area infested by an invasive species. On the, the X axis is time, so as time moves on, as you get an invasive species, it will continue to grow and spread. 
And as it grows and spreads, the control costs continue to increase. So if you look at these different blocks, um, when a species is absent, the most effective way that you can deal with invasive species is to not let it establish itself in the area that you're in. So if you can prevent it from coming over here on a ship or from moving from one lake to another, then you can be successful and that's the way to be most successful. If it does start to um, infest an area, then you can eradicate it if you notice it early enough and you jump on it rapidly to be able to uh, deal with it either by pulling it up or whatever you need to do to get rid of it. If it goes by that point, and, and one thing to really be aware of is that a lot of us aren't going to know that we have an invasive species until it gets to this point. Public awareness typically begins. Uh, so by the time you get here, you would notice you have no opportunity for prevention or eradication. The best that you can do is try to contain it and try to keep it from spreading. And once you get past that point, then what you need to do is, is what we're trying to do in Patty's neighborhood is try to confine and, and uh, eradicate, if we could use that word, within her neighborhood so that it doesn't, not we doesn't continue to move up some of these hollows and brooks up into uh, some of the Catskill forest land. So that's what we're trying to do. But in this area, once you, an invasive species becomes established, then you're going to be really targeted or you'll need to be really targeted in order to address that species successfully. So, like I said, I think this is a good framework. This is how I think about how I do my job, probably Zach similarly. Um, and this is the way that, that you should be thinking about invasive species. Um, you're not going to eradicate something that, that's out here um, out of the state. So New York State, as I said, has been progressive in, in dealing with invasive species and it has established partnerships for regional invasive species management across the, the entire state. There are eight of these PRISMs, is the acronym, uh, including Long Island, Lower Hudson, Capital Mohawk, uh, APIP is where Zach works in the Adirondacks, uh, this is a St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario, Prism, Finger Lakes, Western New York, and the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership is where I work, and I work in Arkville at the Catskill Center. This is a, a good resource, New York State Invasive Species website, um, and you can find information about all of these prisms at that website. Uh, you can also uh, subscribe, there's directions on how to subscribe to the listservs of each of those prisms where we send out information about articles that we might come across, upcoming events, uh, things that are going on that you should be aware of in terms of invasive species. So this is the CRISP region, it's 3.2 million acres. It includes all or parts of seven different counties, all of Otsego, Schoharie, Delaware County, and parts of Green, Ulster, Sullivan, and Orange counties. And, and green here is the DEC land, their major landowner owning 287,500 acres. And then the DEP shown in pink, it doesn't show up too well here, uh, but they own 156,824 acres, excuse me, uh, within our region. And so they're some of our major partners, the major landowners, but it's not just them, but the people that are using their land. Uh, it's important for them to be partners of CRISP. It's important for us to collaborate together and to la leverage the resources that we have so that we can deal with invasive species. So the Catskill Regional Invasive Species Partnership, our mission is to promote prevention, early detection, rapid response, and control of invasive species to protect natural resources. We conduct 
public outreach and management activities and support research on ecological impact and effective controls of invasive species. So we're doing education, we're training people how to identify invasive species, how to report them, um, training citizen scientists to do some of that work, supporting academic research into invasive species control and management, uh, and also trying to work with partners to, to develop a network of people and organizations working together where we can leverage our resources because nobody can do this alone and that's what New York State recognized when it started these PRISMs is that it wanted a regional approach to invasive species management, not a top-down management trying to uh, manage invasive species the same way throughout the state, but wanting to hear from who are the people that live in these different regions, what are the organizations that are working in these different regions, and how do they think that we could deal with invasive species, and what are the most, ones, what are the most important ones to work on, and what are the priorities that we should have with invasive species. So I'm going to hand it off to Zach, and he's going to talk about his program. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm a little bit of an outsider here in the sense that I'm from the Adirondacks, but I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak with you all. And I just wanted to share a little bit of information about our PRISM. So as John mentioned, there are eight in New York State. We are one of those eight. Um, very similar to CRISP, just basically servicing a different geographic area. So we cover all the Adirondack Park and then the rooftop portions of Clinton and Franklin County. So you can think about that as that small piece between the top of the Adirondacks and New York's border with Canada. And we're very similar to CRISP in that we're a partnership organization and we work closely with a lot of different organizations, with the public, with volunteers and citizen scientists to help us accomplish our mission of protecting the Adirondacks from the negative impacts of invasive species. And our four principal partners, our founding partners are the Nature Conservancy, who serves as our host organization. So we share an office with them in Keene Valley, uh, right in the heart of the Adirondacks. And we also work closely with the Department of Environmental Conservation, Adirondack Park Agency, and Department of Transportation. Um, so as I mentioned, our mission is to protect the Adirondacks from invasive species, and we do that through a variety of different activities and actions, some of which include education, outreach, and prevention. So we want to push a lot of this down that invasion curve into that um, prevention category, and we do that by educating people about invasive species and best management practices that they can uh, use to help prevent spread or prevent introduction. So training our highway departments on um, roadside best management practices they can use to help um, stop the introduction of some of these species along our roadways. We have boat, boat decontamination stations to prevent the overland spread of AIS. Those are some, just a couple of examples. Our program is also involved with a lot of surveying and monitoring, both with our own staff and with a large network of volunteers and citizen scientists that are out there on the ground helping us find and uh, quantify some of these priority species in our region. And last but not least, we do a lot of rapid response and management through our own staff as well as contractors. So when we find these um, species that are damaging to the environment or damaging to our economy or to human health, uh, we use our teams and we use our crews to go out on the ground and either try to eradicate them if they're small and we've detected them early, or um, in the cases of, of established populations, just manage them to mitigate the negative impacts that they're having on the environment. Thanks, Zach. Uh, so I, I don't think I mentioned, but I did want to mention that our, each of the PRISMs is funded uh, almost totally, uh, or at least in part, by the Environmental Protection Fund. Maybe Zach mentioned that. But um, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that. That's really important, that if you think that this, these programs are important, then support the state budget in funding that. Um, line of the New York State budget. So I'm going to get into some early detection species. We're going to talk about two early detection species, then we're going to talk about some more common species. Now, if you remember that invasion curve, early detection are the ones that have either not gotten here or they're here in such um, small numbers that we think that we can still eradicate them. So I'm going to talk about two of those, and one is mile a minute. Um, that's Persicaria perfoliata. Um, mile a minute um, kind of grows a mile a minute, not quite. It grows six inches a day. Uh, so it can easily 
outgrow any of the native species that we have. Uh, you can identify it by its alternate simple sharply triangular leaves. Uh, they're light green and six centimeters up to 10 centimeters, six centimeters long up to 10 centimeters wide. Um, they're very narrow vines and they have these recurved spines so they'll climb up over shrubs. Uh, they are, they have this distinctive uh, circular leaf called a okre um, that is, you can see right here, there's one that wraps around the stem. There are other native or there are native species that are look-alikes that have these triangular leaves, but that is diagnostic of the species. And also diagnostic is that the, the white flowers turn into these bright blue berries. Now, it's native to Asia, um, but we have one population of myelomana in the crisp region along the Delaware and Coshecton, which is north of Narrowsburg. So we're trying to address it there um, through mostly hand pulling, but also some herbicide treatments, working with the local landowners in that neighborhood. The next species that I wanted to touch on is uh, Himalayan balsam, Impatiens glandulifera. Uh, it's native to the Himalayas. It, was, it has this beautiful flower. I'll show you the flower in the next slide. Uh, it was intentionally introduced as a landscape or nursery plant uh, in the United States and in Great Britain. It likes to grow in these re riparian environments and we have several populations of it within the crisp region, uh, including out here along the Beaver Kill, uh, up uh, near Lanesville, there's a population, and then there's several others uh, in Sullivan, Sullivan County. You can identify this plant. It has these uh, lance-shaped leaves that are two to nine inches long. They're a soft green color, but most striking is the pink flowers of this plant, and it's gonna flower at the, the end of the summer, so in August or early September, you might see the flowers. It grows in the same environments as our, our native uh, Impatiens capensis, the common jewel weed or spotted jewel weed, the touch-me-not that you touch that will spring those seeds out. This one does the same thing, so when it's growing over a stream, those seeds can be propelled into your stream and then washed downstream and it can spread that way. It grows really densely and it can outcompete native species. Moving on to a forest pest that we have, Hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it has these white cottony masses uh, where it lays its eggs and develops its larvae inside these cottony masses. Are all of you familiar with, with hemlock woolly adelgid? Okay. Um, it's, has these, it's a very small insect, uh, aphid-like insect, has this crawler face that can crawl up onto birds' legs and be transported. Uh, it can be moved by wind or it can move from tree to tree. It moves really slowly. Um, it was first detected in Virginia in 1951, and now it's found in 17 states. What it does is it feeds on the xylem of the tree. Uh, it uh, drills its mouth parts into the, the twigs at the base of the needle, and eventually the foliage dies, uh, and because the tree is, is trying to close that off um, and, and treats that as a wound, so it kind of, uh, just closes those twigs off and then the, the branchlets will die, the needles will, be, um, will fall from the tree. There's mortality, usually within four to 20 years. Uh, it, it, it's a slow mortality that may be slowed by cold winters, uh, but it's inevitable. Eventually the trees are gonna die. And these hemlock woolly adelgid populations grow quickly, and there's no resistance within the eastern hemlock, which is our native species. The eastern hemlock range is shown in dark green here. Uh, the Carolina hemlock, which is a closely 
um, related hemlock grows in the southern Appalachians. Its range is shown in, in uh, lavender here. The cross-hashed area is the area that's infected by hemlock woolly adelgid. So you can see that HWA has covered about half of the range of the eastern hemlock in the eastern United States. And why is this important? There's no other tree that we have here in the Catskills, or in New York State for that matter, that grows the same, that has the same structure as the eastern hemlock. So if we lose it, we lose that structure, and it jeopardizes a lot of the species that depend on that tree to, to survive. It's really important wildlife habitat. It, these trees help to regulate water flow throughout the year. They help cool the water in streams and lakes. Uh, they make the water more suitable for trout. You'll have three times more brook trout in streams where you have a lot of hemlock trees uh, along the stream. They're aesthetically valuable as a beautiful part of the Catskills, or one of the things that helped to make the Catskills and the Adirondacks beautiful. Uh, and some hemlock forests are old growth. There are some trees that are over 500 years old, and Michael Kudish has identified 31 old growth stands in New York State, and we're mapping them on GIS, and we want to protect those. When hemlocks die, it opens up an opportunity for other invasive species, and with a lot of these invasive species, you get these cascading effects uh, of one invasive changing the environment and making it easier for other invasive species to move in. I think Zach's going to hit on that uh, later on in the invasive species management planning. So I was listening to some of the birds outside this morning when I was outside. Uh, I heard my first cat bird. Um, but this is a great time of year to be in the Catskills because migration is happening. So there's waves of birds coming through every day and there's, there'll be more birds tomorrow versus today, and, and it's great to be out. Plus, there's a lot of plants flowering now, so you get to see a lot of the spring ephemerals, and you got to get out there now. As soon as we're done talking, we'll be outside, so um, you won't miss it. But these are some of the birds that depend on these hemlocks to survive. The Blackburnian warbler, I mean, look at this warbler. It's an incredible bird, really bright orange colors. You don't often see it because it's way up in the hemlock boughs, but um, it has an incredible song, too. The black-throated green warbler is a bird that is often associated with hemlock forest. The solitary vireo, which I, I heard one out here this morning, uh, an Acadian flycatcher you have here in the Eastern Catskills, also associated with hemlock forest. And each of these birds may be suffering as the hemlocks decline. And who knows what will happen if we do lose hemlocks here in this area. Now, hemlocks are the third most abundant tree in New York State. This is a map of the density of hemlocks in New York State. And you can see some of the highest densities that we have are along the eastern and north part of the Catskills here, and then really dense along the outside of the Adirondacks here. And a lot of these areas are in the upper part of watersheds that provide water supply for a lot of people, not just here in the Catskills, but also in the Adirondacks. So as those trees die, um, it, it, there may be changes to, to some of those drinking water supplies. but. Um, I wanted to point this out because it took me a while to line this up, but uh, if you look at the where hemlocks are, are densest and then you compare it to where is hemlock woolly adelgid in New York State, which is the next map, uh, this shows all of the towns that have hemlock woolly adelgid in New York State. And you can see based on uh, this um, with the key down here that Hemlock woolly adelgid first moved into New York State in the 1980s and, and uh, 1990s. First moved into the Catskills in the late 90s, uh, then has slowly spread throughout New York State. Um, but it hasn't, throughout parts of New York State, I, I should say, but because I want to say that it hasn't gotten to a lot of New York State, including those really dense, mature stands that are in the Adirondacks. 
So it moves so slowly that we actually have this window of, of opportunity to do something about hemlock woolly adelgid where we, we, we haven't in the, in the Catskills with things like emerald ash borer. And uh, this is a map of the observations of hemlock woolly adelgid within the crisp region, which is shown in green here, outlined in green. You can see that all of these squares and um, these circles, green and yellow, they show where we have observations of hemlock woolly adelgid. This is from IMAP Invasives, which is a program I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, but you can see that there's a lot of hemlock woolly adelgid here. But as you get up into the like northern Otsego County, up near Cooperstown, they don't have hemlock woolly adelgid yet, or at least we haven't documented it yet. Um, we want to have more people out there looking. So an, an interesting thing, thinking about that invasion, uh, that invasive species curve and that invasion curve, uh, you go from being really established with hemlock woolly adelgid to it being an early detection species, which it, it is in the Adirondacks. So our management of it is different depending on where it is. Uh, moving on to the next invasive species, one that's dear to Patty's heart and I know dear to a lot of yours is, uh, or maybe the bane of, of yours is uh, Japanese knotweed. And this is what it looks like right now. It's just starting to come up, kind of looks like asparagus, but uh, has these really thick stems. The leaves are starting to come out. Um, it has these purple spots on the stems of it and that helps you to recognize what it is. Again, the purple stems, if you cut them open, then you'll see that they're hollow, uh, but they're also segmented. There is these segments across the, um, when, you, when you cut it in cross-section, you can see it. It does look like bamboo to some degree, uh, but the leaves in bamboo are, are really lance-shaped versus uh, in Japanese knotweed, they're more heart-shaped. Uh, there is some variability. There's variability in the size, uh, in the shape, but uh, it has these zig zigzaggy stems that you want to look for. Uh, it flowers the end of the summer, early fall, and you'll see these uh, big areas of the beaver kill out in the, the western Catskills or even along the Esopus. Uh, you'll see these big, dense populations of Japanese knotweed. Uh, and as Patty was saying, it really seemed to spread after uh, Hurricane Irene, Tropical Storm Lee. And what it does is, it, as you break pieces off of it, each of those pieces can reestablish, reroot itself. So if you have a big flooding event during the summer or late summer, uh, as it breaks apart, then each of those pieces is washed downstream and can establish itself on the bare soil uh, from the flooding events. And it makes streams more susceptible um, to washing out. Uh, it makes more uh, or less stable uh, stream banks. As you can see from this picture, these are, this is the root structure of native plants. Uh, when streams start to wash out, stream banks are really uh, resistant to uh, erosion if there's a lot of native plants that are there. But Japanese knotweed has these, these big thick rhizomes and it doesn't hold the soil the same way. And then each of these little rhizomes, as I said, as it breaks apart, then those can reestablish themselves downstream. So, it can outgrow the native species and shade them out, and then it makes the stream banks less stable over time. So it's really important uh, that if we can control that in some areas and we, we can identify where those areas are, that we try to do that and to protect some of the, the, the headwaters that we have in the Catskills. So what can you do about it? I think it's really important that uh, you learn about what invasive species are out there and which ones are most important and what you can do about them. And one thing that you can do about them if you can identify invasive species is that if you come to one of our trainings or one offered by any of the prisms around New York State, 
there's this program called IMAP Invasives uh, where you can report in an online database the invasive species that you see. And you can either do it on your PC or you can take your smartphone out in the field and you can take a picture of something. You can upload it into this database. An expert will look at it, verify that it was what you think it was, and then that gets entered into the database as a dot. So looking at hemlock woolly adelgida again here, uh, what we see are these green dots are confirmed observations. Uh, these square, orange, orange squares, I should say, are uh, observations where the location wasn't exactly noted. These, these green spots are areas where the location was either uh, GPSed or somebody used a smartphone. Uh, and the other thing I would point out is that these yellow uh, circles are, are spots where the observation hasn't been confirmed yet. And these get sent up to people um, usually at DEC in Albany or at IMAP Invasives who will look at the picture that you took and confirm that it was what you thought it was, whether it was hemlock woolly adelgid or Japanese knotweed or whatever it was that you've been, you imported, you reported. Number one, it's right in the voicemail. And I know it's a hemlock woolly adelgid. I don't know why I got a yellow dot out of it. Yeah, so it takes, there's um, actually one of the um, hemlock. Uh, I didn't have a picture because I, I don't have a smartphone. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it takes a while. What I was going to say is some that I've reported, it takes a while for them to confirm the observations. So, <laughs> uh, so we can check on it. Maybe we can send them an email. <laughs> so maybe you could document it again, is, is take a picture and then send it in with them. Um, so, the, so the importance of this is that it's not just you guys reporting it, but it's also that this is what I use to look at, well, what are the things that I should be working on? What are the things that are so abundant that I can't do anything about versus things that are just moving into an area? It helps us to strategize what's out there, what's around us, helps us to, to really understand where we are along that invasion curve. So you can um, go to the website, um, imapinvasives.org. You can find out about trainings. Uh, I'll show you the trainings that that we have uh, here in the CRISP region. And you can also, um, this focuses on hemlock woolly adelgid, but what we really need are people that are able to identify invasive species and monitor them, help us to monitor them and report that information. So we're doing a lot of trainings um, of citizen scientists to locate for instance, hemlock stands and to monitor those hemlock stands to see are they infested with hemlock woolly adelgid? Do they have elongate hemlock scale, which is another invasive pest? Uh, what is the status of the trees? Are they healthy? Are they not healthy? Uh, we're putting all that information together and we're using that as a strategy to figure out what are the stands that are most um, important in the Catskills and what are the ones that we need to protect going forward and how are we going to protect them. Uh, we're developing a hemlock woolly adelgid phenology protocol to look at the life stages of hemlock woolly adelgid through the year. It helps us to understand when we can do certain treatments like release certain biocontrol to be most effective. And we're working with this guy, Mark Whitmore, who most of you know probably. He's from Cornell. He has a lab that he's, he's starting at Cornell to be able to raise biocontrol. He's been going around the state raising awareness about hemlock woolly adelgid and that we can do something about it. Uh, and the, the purpose, one purpose of this is that we can, we want to build support among local communities uh, about invasive species and, and what they can do about it and how they can help us to do about it. So I won't go through all of the events that we have, but I did want to point out that we have, each of the PRISMs has quarterly meetings and you're welcome to come to the CRISP meetings. We have one coming up on Tuesday at 10 o'clock at the Catskill Center in Arkville. 
Uh, you're welcome to come to that. If you want to learn more about invasive species, we all have, always have a speaker. Um, we're always networking and talking about what works and what doesn't. And we have a number of IMAP invasives trainings, including one will be on, on June 3rd at the Catskill Interpretive Center in Mount Tremper uh, that I'll be leading with uh, Meg Wilkinson from the IMAP Invasives Group. Good resources are www.catskillinvasives.com, which is our website, our CRISP website, and then we have a Facebook page, uh, Catskill Invasives. So I'm going to hand it back to Zach. <laughs> And it's like he's a relay. Gonna talk about prevention. Thanks, John. <clears throat> so when we think back to that um, invasion curve, which we keep going back to because it's it's so important and it really is a great way to illustrate the the work that we do and how we decide uh, to do our work. If we remember the most uh, the most effective and most efficient point on that invasion curve that we can address invasive species is at the beginning. It's the prevention category. So making sure that some of these, these plants and some of these insects and animals don't arrive here in the first place. Or if they are here, at least preventing spread from invaded to uninvaded areas. So what I wanted to do is kind of go through a couple of what are basically simple steps that you can take to help prevent or minimize the spread of some of these species. And this certainly isn't an exhaustive list, um, but it's just hitting some key things that are um, you know, not overly burdensome, relatively easy actions that you can take on your properties or just changes in behavior that positively influence uh, invasive species spread prevention. So um, uh, Patty had a lot of great points when she started and one of them that resonated with me was talking about how Japanese knotweed was introduced um, near her property as an ornamental, which is such a common story for a lot of these species and it's something that we have seen historically a lot. Um, thankfully, in New York now, we have some regulations that prohibit a lot of these plants from being sold and introduced and planted, but there are, are others out there that are still known to be invasive, yet they're sold in nurseries, they're available for sale, um, so you can't find them. So, Why sell? Why don't they take them out? Um, that is a good question. So there's an there's a, a extensive process to go through and identify, believe it or not, what is invasive enough to take off the market. Um, Yep. Yeah, so there are, there are some that are proven facts and there are others that there isn't enough scientific research available yet, but we have a, a, an idea, a pretty good idea that they're invasive. Yep, exactly. So one of the easy steps is to not use those invasive species in your garden and landscaping and focus more on using natives uh, and even non-invasives. So things that aren't going to escape cultivation, things that aren't going to take over natural areas, and species that in reality are going to provide the greatest benefit for wildlife, and a lot of them are, are still very pretty and attractive. If you do a lot of recreation, it's pretty easy um, to spread some of these plants, both on land and in water. So if you're hiking or, or bird watching or doing anything outdoors, an easy step is to clean your boots or clean your equipment or your clothing to make sure that you're not inadvertently spreading around small little seeds and the soles of your boots are attached to you or attached to your, your dog or something like that. So just brush yourself off, clean your boots before um, moving between areas. It's a really simple step and one that um, I try to do whenever I'm out and about. And the same goes for aquatic recreation. So if you're boating or fishing, when you leave a lake, make sure that you're, you're checking your watercraft and you're checking your gear, making sure that there aren't uh, fragments of plants attached to your trailer or vessel, making sure that there's not standing water in your bilge or your livel that could harbor small-bodied aquatic invasive organisms like the zebra mussel or spiny water flea, things that we can't see but can live in that water and be spread from one water body to another. So taking those simple steps or visiting a decontamination station if they're available in your region or even just spraying your boat off at home, all of those things are uh, really great steps that you can take to prevent the spread of some of these species. Don't move firewood. I'm sure this is a, a catchphrase that many of you have already heard. So when it comes to forest pests and pathogens, one of their primary spread mechanisms, once they arrive in New York State, one of the ways that they get around locally is firewood. So we have a regulation that prohibits the, the movement of firewood in New York more than 50 miles. But if you want to you know, take it one step further, just buy local, find firewood where you go. Don't take the risk of moving your firewood because it could be harboring inside the larva of invasive species or invasive insects. And last but not least, um, managing small infestations to limit their spread. 
um, and minimize the impacts that they're already having on the environment. And this will lead into some of the discussion we're going to have later on. But this is um, a great thing that you can do on your own properties or by getting engaged with a prism and participating in a management event. So by addressing invasive species, by managing them or treating them, you're slowing their spread across the landscape. It's recognizing that, yes, they're here, but we can slow their advances. And it's particularly important for some of those early detection species that John mentioned earlier. So things that aren't already widespread, if we start to address them where we find them, maybe we won't just slow them down, but we'll eradicate them. And a lot of these species are relatively easy to manage if they're caught early. But that is the key, is catching them early. I'm gonna... And uh, I want to point out something that Zach was talking about. Uh, this plant-wise brochure talks about um, some of the alternatives that you have when you're thinking of buying an invasive species. There are native alternatives that you could use that might flower at the same time, might have the same color flower, might have the same structure of the species that you're interested in. So um, pick up these, share them with your neighbors. Uh, there's lots of alternatives out there. So uh, in terms of, uh, we're going to talk about biological control a little bit. So I wanted to just hit on this, that um, you can't just go to Japan and grab a species and bring it over to to New York State uh, and release it as a biocontrol. You need to go through a long process and there has to be a finding of no significant impact. Um, that this is regulated, you have to get a series of permits in order to release a biocontrol here in New York State. There's, the bottom of this slide is that it needs to go through a lot of testing to make sure that it's only eating whatever it is that you want it to eat and it's not eating something that's related, something that's, that serves in that same ecological niche, et cetera. So that's really important when uh, you're thinking about biocontrol. There are biocontrol that are available for some of these species that we've mentioned. Uh, for instance, mile a minute does have a, there is a beetle that is available that you could get that causes these little holes in mile a minute. Uh, there, the populations of this aren't big enough to be able to eat all of that down in Koshekton where I'm working um, or in the, the Hudson Valley where mile a minute also grows. But you do see a lot of the perforated leaves uh, because that beetle is feeding on some of the leaves at least. But luckily, if you have a small, if you find a small infestation of, of mile a minute, first of all, call me up, send me an email, call me on my cell phone, I want to know right now. <laughs> I don't, don't report it to invasives and we find out like weeks or years later. <laughs> no, somebody would, would, be, would, that would get somebody's attention. <laughs> So um, you can, it is easy, to, it, 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 it's not well rooted, um, you can pull it up really easily. Um, if you want to come help us pull it up this summer, we'll be having some, some removal events down in Koshekton and you, you're welcome to come join me for that. Um, foliar herbicides will work on it. Um, You'll need to use herbicides if you have large infestations on it. It, it grows really fast, first of all. Uh, the site in Koshekton last year, we went in May. It hadn't even started coming up yet because last year was the cold spring, if you remember. Um, by June, there were vines that were six feet long. Um, we pulled them all out. Um, we came back in July. There were vines that were seven feet long. <laughs> that had re-sprouted from, from where we had already pulled. So it grows really fast. Um, you need to, to jump on it and stop it from, from spreading and stop it from seeding. But it is easy to pull, which is good. Uh, this is another species, um, the Hamalian balsam again. That's an early detection species. It pulls relatively easily, but it grows really densely. And as I was saying, it could shoot its seeds out into a little stream like this one and could spread. Um, it has large leaves, so herbicides 
uh, if you use a foliar application, it has a lot of leaf area to absorb all of that herbicide. Now, hemlock woolly adelgid, there's a, there's a couple controls and, and the chemicals that are available now are very effective and they've been proven to be effective with hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, you can use imidacloprid, uh, with, it's very slow moving, it lasts for a long time, so that can be applied uh, either as a soil drench treatment, um, it can be injected into the stem, or, or a basal bark treatment, which of those are very effective, uh, and it will last for a long time, seven years. Uh, Dinutefiren is more fast moving. It's effective for one year or more and it's environmentally benign. And the most effective thing is to use, use the two together where this one's fast moving and this one's slow moving. So you only need to treat the trees like once every seven years or so. It's not that you need to go out to each of these trees and retreat them. Uh, these are things that you can use in the forest environment and they're being used by New York State Parks and other organizations and agencies. Uh, you can save your hemlock trees. You could hire, if you have hemlock trees in your yard that you want to save, you could hire a licensed applicator to use any of these treatments. And it's become much cheaper recent, recently. Um, it's one to two dollars per diameter inch of the tree um, and you need to follow the uh, labels of these chemicals but like I said you could use a licensed applicator to do the treatments. And then there's biological control agents that are available. Uh, Mark Whitmore at Cornell University has been collecting Laracobius nigrinus beetles, which is the, the beetle up here. It has good synchrony with the hemlock woolly adelgid. Um, it's been shown in the, the southeastern United States that its population will grow and it can be effective on hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, any of these biocontrols are gonna take a long period of time in order to be effective, but as you get further, thinking of that invasion curve again, as you get further to the right on that invasion curve, the only widespread treatment that may be effective would be using biocontrols uh, so that you're doing it on a, on a large scale. Um, there's also two species of the Leucopus silverfly that have been collected in the Pacific Northwest and, and Mark Whitmore is working with at his lab and, and at Cornell. So I'm gonna hand it back to Zach and he's gonna talk about a case study and um, invasive species management plans. There is one in Chokan. <laughs> Is it, I mean, is it by 28 or? Um, it's north of 28, yeah. I wouldn't say exactly. We don't want to dis, yeah, it's private residence, yeah. But um, the other thing I could mention, since you mentioned hemlock hedges, if, is if you have a hemlock hedge, um, they've been shown to, because when they're pruned, there's a lot of growth, like internal growth in the hedges of hemlocks. Um, and hemlock woolly adelgids find, find those to be really appetizing. So you can get these big populations of hemlock woolly adelgid that are growing on hemlocks and those are great places to release the biocontrol where there's a lot of food available and what we need with the biocontrol is that there'll be a lot of hemlock woolly adelgid in an area and that the, the biocontrol population will be able to grow over time. Sorry, Zach. I'll oh, no, that's, to that's Zach. totally fine. Um, so next, what, what we're kind of going to do is take a little bit deeper dive and talk about um, actual management. So speaking to kind of Patty's call to action here, I'm going to share a little bit of information about uh, a similar scenario in the Adirondacks where 
uh, we've kind of been rallying to manage Japanese knotweed um, across a lot of different parts of our prism. And before I started speaking, I passed around a couple of our, or this, this handout here. So this is kind of like a, like a cheat sheet that you can take home with you. It's going to have a lot of the, the items that I'm talking about. So don't feel like you need to remember everything from this presentation. That's a great resource that you can use um, later on at home. But what I'd like to do is basically just walk through uh, the invasive species management process or management cycle. And this is also outlined in that handout. Um, but it can be simplified into basically a five-step process, starting with establishing goals, goals that are realistic, goals that are achievable, um, choosing what we want to manage and where we want to manage it, developing a plan of action um, to move forward, and then actually implementing our management tools and following up and reassessing as needed. So what I'll, I'll do is basically go through all of these steps kind of high level and provide a broad overview. <clears throat> and then I'll try to ground those with a, a specific example of how we, we did that in the Adirondacks. So to start, um, you want to establish goals. And again, one of the most important things is making sure that these are um, achievable, that they're realistic, and they have metrics uh, that you can use to gauge whether or not you're being successful or if you need to make some changes to your management process. And oftentimes when people are, are dealing with an invasive pest, whether it's a plant or an insect, they just, they just say, I want to get rid of it. And that's great. I would liken that to the top of the tier here. That would be eradication, getting rid of it completely. Um, but it is important to recognize when we think about that invasion curve, depending on where the population is or where the species is, Getting rid of it might not always be possible and might not always be a realistic, achievable goal. So there are multiple levels of control you might strive for, starting with the, the, the golden standard of eradication at the top of the pyramid, all the way down to nothing. So, eradic Oop, getting ahead of myself. so eradication would be eliminating all invasive plants and their seed sources or propagules from an area, with a limited likelihood that you're going to have to go back and address that again in, in the foreseeable future. So that, is the gold standard. Unfortunately, it is, is not always achievable. If something is well established on the landscape, um, it spreads readily, produces a lot of seed, that might not be a target for eradication. But if it's something like the mile a minute, where maybe there's only one infestation in the prism or in a, in a, in a large area, that might be something we would seek eradication for. And then moving down the tier, they're kind of lower levels of control. So containment is keeping an invasive species in a specific area. So recognizing that you might not get rid of it in its entirety, but we can at least keep it to a confined area and limit where those impacts are occurring. And kind of opposite to that, if you had a large area that was uninvaded and surrounded by invasive species, you may choose to contain them into that surrounding landscape to protect that, that core uninvaded area. And moving further down is suppression. So this is, um, for some, it's kind of a, it's a little bit sadder case. So this is the point where there's not a whole lot that we can, re we can really do at this point, and the species is so widespread, or perhaps we don't have the resources necessary to manage it. So we choose specific areas to focus on in order to um, either um, maintain native species, maintain an ecosystem function, provide access, or, or something of that nature. So it's a specific focus um, in a specific area that we're, we're treating. And last but not least, is the do nothing. So something might just be so widespread, it might require so many resources that we'd be better off focusing on something else. And we have to just learn to live with the invasive at that, at that spot. So a good, actually, I won't provide an example. So I did want to provide two sort of graphic, uh, graphical examples of this or maps and have a little quiz. So this is a, the Grass River. It's in, it's in the Adirondacks. You can actually hardly make out the river. It's so small. But you can see over about a one and a half mile stretch, we have about 15 patches of Japanese knotweed. Each one of these little shields represents an infestation of knotweed. And these on average are about 0 0.05 acres in size. So they're really small. So if we were establishing a management goal for this, what do you think we might shoot for? Any guesses? Yeah, so this would probably be the top of the tier. There aren't many patches, they're small patches. And in all likelihood, with sustained efforts, we could get rid of this um, in this particular river system. And now contrast that to the Branch River, which is in Elizabethtown, also in the Adirondacks. Again, about a one and a half mile stretch of river, but well over 100 patches. They're still small. They're only you know, maybe a tenth of an acre in size, but there are a lot of them. So what do you think here? So this, in my opinion, would probably be either a do-nothing 
or suppression. From our program standpoint, this is a do nothing for us. We recognize that we don't have the resources to go in here. But if you were a private landowner on this stream and you had knotweed in front of your house, you may choose to suppress that particular infestation to maybe um, maintain the view shed or provide access to the river but recognizing that it's gonna to continue to be around you, it's gonna to continue to try to move back in. So that's gonna be an effort that you're gonna to have to maintain essentially into perpetuity. But you could certainly um, reduce the levels to the point where it's not having significant impacts to your property. So that's one example. Um, and it can be difficult to figure out what is the realistic goal that you wanna strive for. And I just wanted to point out this tool. This is a, a great resource if you haven't uh, seen it before. It's the Invasive Plant Management Decision Analysis Tool, or IPMDAT. It's a great acronym. Um, and this is basically a qualitative matrix that will ask you questions about your invasive species management project, like the size of the infestation, the species you're dealing with, what type of resources you have available. And it'll help uh, provide you um, with a recommendation of whether you should seek eradication or maybe you want to only do containment or suppression or not proceed at all. And this is free and available online at this website, um, ipmdat.org. And I would highly recommend before undertaking any invasive species management project, regardless of scale, that you just take a quick look at this and maybe plug in some information and run your project uh, through that, that planning tool. Because it can help make sure that you're, you're, what you're getting into isn't going to be um, unachievable. You don't want to continue to throw resources at something only to find out you're, you're never going to be successful in the first place. And we've, we've had that experience a couple times, unfortunately, when we weren't using this tool. So for the Adirondack Park, for our program, um, we recognize that our prism, which you can see outlined here, is a six and a half million acre prism. Over uh, the course of about 10 years of surveying, we documented a lot of knotweed patches, which is no surprise. It's a widespread plant in New York. So taking a closer look, we knew it was widespread along our state road corridors, which are represented by these lines. And there were some cases where it was getting into intact natural areas. So at a landscape scale, at a prism scale, we knew eradication wasn't an option, unfortunately. As much as we might have liked it to have been, it's not. So we had to sort of narrow our focus, either uh, trying to achieve a lower standard or focusing on specific areas. We also know that the Adirondacks, much like the Catskills, is rich in natural resources. So we have a lot of protected lands, a lot of, of wetlands, of lakes and ponds, and of particular interest are our rivers. So 30,000 miles of rivers and streams in the Adirondacks. And I think everyone here probably knows the impact that not we can have to rivers and streams. So that was something that we kept in mind when we were setting our goals and recognizing that that was a, a resource we really needed to protect because all it takes are small patches of knotweed like this, as we know, a high water event comes through, it puts them into the stream, they're deposited in the stream banks, root, and they end up with something like this. So this is what we were really hoping to avoid um, or, pre or prevent with our management work. So our goals, just broadly speaking, kind of qualitative goals, we wanted to protect air, our riparian corridors and areas of conservation value. And the way that we to chose to do that was to engage in those river systems with management and those that had few known occurrences, which is, which is qualitative, but few known occurrences, we're going to try to eradicate knotweed from those systems. But areas like the branch where it's well established and there are a lot of patches, we recognize that we can't get rid of that, but maybe we can contain it. And it sounds like um, when Patty was talking about some of the river systems here, you might still be in this number one, where you do have the opportunity to eradicate um, from some of these systems. So it's great to be thinking about these things now because, of course, the longer we wait, the, the harder it's going to be and the further up we're going to get on that invasion curve. So depending on um, your, your particular management project, you, you might need to do some prioritization. And that might be prioritizing species or prioritizing infestations or both. So this slide is kind of talking about species. And the example I provided is um, spotted knapweed versus Japanese knotweed. So in the Adirondacks, I would argue that both of these are widespread, and both of them have impacts. Um, however, we're only focusing on, well, not only, but we're focusing on Japanese knotweed. We're not focusing on spotted knapweed. And the reason for that is because we prioritize Japanese knotweed higher based on some of these um, criteria outlined in the bottom of the slide. For example, the severity of the impact. At least in our region, where we see spotted knapweed occurring, it's most commonly human disturbed habitats, the sides of the road, waste piles, fill piles, things like that. Whereas Japanese knotweed, it's also in those areas, but it's in some really high quality conservation 
areas that we would like to protect, where we just don't see that for, na for knapweed. So rather than focusing on something that's associated with, a, with just human disturbance, we're focusing on a species that's associated with natural areas. Some of the other things you might consider are regional distribution. So the myelominter, or the Himalayan balsam, for example, have a limited regional distribution, so they might be higher priority than something that is already established and widespread. You should consider difficulty of control. Some species, incredibly difficult to control. Um, and it's gonna take a lot of resources and a lot of time to address. So maybe those aren't the highest priority. And um, dispersal ability, particularly long distance dispersal. So we think about something like, like Japanese barberry that can be dispersed by birds eating the berries and carrying those seeds off into the understory or into different parts of the forest. That's a spread vector we can't control. Um, so you, if you were to choose to manage a species that is capable of long distance dispersal, just recognizing that there's a pretty good likelihood it's gonna be continued uh, or continue to be reintroduced by those vectors. And lastly, I'll mention associated stressors. So we're kind of lucky in the Adirondacks, we don't have to worry about a ton of these, but a great example is deer and deer overabundance. And um, uh, eating all of the native species, so basically the only thing that's left behind are the invasives. So um, just recognizing that even if you get rid of invasives, there might be other associated stressors that are impacting your particular site. And at an infestation level, so deciding, and you know, we know what species we want to manage now, uh, but which ones or which patches or which infestation sh should be managed first? And there are a couple of things that are, are mentioned here. These are also mentioned in your, your nifty handout. But some of the things they mentioned to consider, if you're dealing with a vine, and these are of particular interest for riparian corridors. So they mention vines because they have the ability to grow up on top of and over shrubs and trees. And when they do that, they smother those host plants, they kill them, and then we lose the ecosystem function or the, or the services that those shrubs and trees provide. So holding the stream bank in place. Once those trees are dead, they're no longer going to be stabilizing that sediment and we see increased rates of erosion. Kind of from a, from a, a human focused perspective, we might choose to manage a plant for our use of the landscape to provide either access to the river, recreational opportunities like fishing. It's hard to cast your, your line into a river that's completely aligned with Japanese knotweed. You catch a lot of knotweed, you don't catch a lot of fish. So that might be something we wanna, you would like to prioritize on your property. Considering spread potential, so those infestations closest to the riverbank that might be wiped out, those, those are the ones we probably wanna deal with first and then move our way inland to those that are less likely to be spread. Some dangerous plants like giant hogweed and wild parsnip are Sometimes priorities for folks, if they're, they're walking around in an area, they have kids walking around in an area, pets, you might want to choose to manage those dangerous plants so they're not impacting your health. And lastly, or not lastly, aesthetics, so just making, sh making it pretty. That's important to some folks. Or if you're thinking from a, more of an ecological standpoint, you might be trying to protect rare or unique species, either plants or animals, or increasing the value of your, your land for wildlife. So those are all factors that you can consider when trying to choose which species or which infestations to manage first. So before you dive in and you know, start pulling weeds, start spraying plants, it's important to have a plan or a goal moving forward. And we'll call that the, the, a site management plan or invasive species management plan. And the basis of an invasive species management plan should be those uh, realistic goals and well-defined objectives that you can measure against to determine whether or not you're being successful. And I like to break them down into just these simple questions of the who, the what, the when, and the where. So the who is, you know, what species are you targeting? Who is going to be doing the management? Is it something that you're capable of doing on your own? Or are you going to need to contract out with a certified applicator, for example, to treat your hemlock trees? What are the management tools that you're going to be using and what, um, it, or, or will it be multiple tools? Maybe you'll start with mechanical management, uh, realize that that's, that's not strong enough and you might need to change to an herbicide or you might need to utilize a biological control for those well-established invasives. When is an important question to ask. When do you want to go out and do this management? And that's important because different species have different reproductive cycles, they have different biologies, and they're vulnerable at, at different times of the year. So something like garlic mustard I see here is already flowering. Um, so you'd want to get out there and manage that quickly if, if that was your target species because you want to get to it before it's setting seed. Um, something like Japanese knotweed, we manage much later in the season, particularly if we're using herbicide as our tool because that's when we're going to get the most effective translocation of that product down into the roots. And finally, where? So where are we going to engage? Is it everywhere? Is it certain focal areas? Um, just simple questions that we can ask to help point our management in the right direction. 
So for us in the Adirondacks, uh, we, we focus on many different species that we address with our, our team and our own staff. We use a variety of different tools, actually all three of these listed here, and are, are targeting species specific to their biology at different times of the year across the prism. So it's kind of a broad management plan, but just to provide some, some I guess, real world examples. So when you're actually going out there to implement the management, this is kind of a nice, nice uh, gra figure, I guess, that, that walks through the process of managing an infestation. The ideal scenario is that you have enough time, you have the resources, you can just go and treat the whole thing in one shot. That's great. Um, sometimes that's not feasible or it's not possible. Either it's too large of a patch or you might not have time. And in that instance, what we would generally recommend, is, this is speaking really to plants, is that you would work from kind of the leading edge into the core. And the reason for this is that by addressing these small satellite patches or little outliers, you're halting the spread of that infestation, you're slowing it down. And it's also these little outliers that are most likely to expand the most quickly. So in the core here, this invasive has really already used up all of its habitat. It's, it's there, it's having impacts, but it's not gonna really take over any new area. Out here, there's a lot of white space around here where it can still expand. So we wanna stop that now or when the plants are, or when the infestations are small and easiest to address. So we work from the exterior into the core. For us in the Adirondacks, managing Japanese knotweed, I'll talk about a couple of the tools or, or management techniques specific uh, to this species. Um, if they're small populations, you can do some mechanical control, so digging up the plants. I will say that it is a really tough plant. It has an incredible root system and it's in its, its lateral distribution. So where you're actually seeing plants coming up out of the ground, those roots might be sticking 40 feet to each side underground. And in order to effectively manage this, you need to get rid of all of that above ground and below ground material. Anything that's left behind is going to send up new shoots. So digging up all those plants, bagging them, that can be one of the management tools that we implement for small populations. But most of the time, because we're working at a, at a landscape scale, and we're dealing with some larger patches, we'll use herbicides as our primary treatment mechanism. And we want to be selective as possible. I think that's important to mention, even though it's, I'm sure, on all of your minds. We don't just want to get rid of the invasive plants. We want to promote the recovery of native species at that site, our desirable species. So by using the stem injection technique, we deposit a small amount of herbicide into that hollow um, came, and remember the inside of that is hollow, that herbicide goes directly into the target plant and is not going to affect any other vegetation around that. So that's one of the tools we use. For plants that are too small uh, to inject, we'll, we'll do a foliar spray um, using a backpack or handheld sprayer, very selective to those invasives. And we're using for both of these a glyphosate-based uh, herbicide product. Last but not least, you know, your management process doesn't end at treating. Um, you still need to follow up and monitor and assess assess the impacts that your management had. So here are just a couple of kind of primer questions, things you can ask yourself following treatment. So number one, was it effective? Um, hopefully yes, if it was, that's great. Continue down the same road. Or uh, maybe if you've reduced the population enough, you can use a less, um, like you, maybe you can tr transition from using chemical means to mechanical with fewer plants. Uh, is follow-up treatment required? In most instances, it's going to be required for the first few years. It's, it's pretty rare to get rid of an invasive plant in one shot. Usually you're going to have to follow up for at least three, maybe five years or more. Um, and anything that's left behind, if you don't follow up, it's just going to uh, reproduce and expand and you'll be back at square one. Always, I always like to check for off-target impacts. So did we unintentionally impact uh, native vegetation? Are we seeing impacts to the, to the soil or to water? If there are, that's not good. Um, let's figure out ways that those can be mitigated or maybe we need to change our, our actions. And last but not least, um, are desirable species recovering at an acceptable rate? So remember, we don't want to just get rid of the invasives. We want to see this return uh, to as close, of as close as possible of the community that it was prior to invasion. Um, and if, if natives aren't recovering at an acceptable rate, maybe we'll do some active restoration like planting or, or, or depositing some seed. So in our region, we visit all of our sites annually after, after management. We visit them for several years, several consecutive years, to document whether there are invasive plants still present. Here's that same site the following year. There were some plants present, so we did do a, a small follow-up treatment with a foliar spray. And 
we collect pretty rigorous data. This is certainly not something that is necessarily required if you're treating plants in your own property, but we collect GPS data to document um, whether or not invasive species are still present after management and changes in size. And we can use that to, to build these graphs. And I just wanted to share this as an example to, to show you all that if we do address some of these species early, we can get rid of them. Um, so it's not a lost cause. And I'll walk through just quickly what each one of these bars represents. So uh, gray bars, these are data errors, or we failed to visit a site. That's kind of no data. We can ignore that. Um, these red bars, these represent the first time a site is identified on the landscape. And I should mention that this is specific to our Japanese knotweed. So these are new sites that we've documented. Orange bars represent the initial treatment being performed at that site. Uh, yellow bars, these represent follow-up treatment. So we had to treat for second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth year. And then my favorites are the, the green, the blue, and the purple. These represent sites that, upon follow-up inspection, have no invasive plants observed for one, two, or three or more years. And we don't consider sites to be eliminated or eradicated until there have been at least three consecutive years of no invasive plants observed. So the general trend that we'd like to see over time is the, the, the red, orange, and yellow bars going down, fewer, fewer of those, and more of these green, blue, and purple bars. And that's not exactly what we've seen here, but we are moving in the right direction. Uh, where last field season we documented 11 sites as being eradicated, not too bad, could be better. Uh, four that were, had no plants observed for two years and 18 that had no plants observed for one year. And uh, one thing I will point out that just speaks to the importance of, of reassessing and doing follow-up monitoring mm -hmm. is that if you're looking at this graph, one thing you might notice is that these green, these blue, and the purple bars didn't really start to show up until 2014. And there's a reason for that. Um, We've been monitoring our sites for several years, for many years, and it was in 2013 that we really started to recognize that we weren't seeing these plants uh, disappear at the rate that we were hoping for. Um, so we kind of sat down, scratched our heads, and realized we needed to change our management action, and we started to use a different, uh, different types of herbicide products, and that change in, a, in management technique, I think, is what resulted in seeing more of these sites transitioning into being no plants observed. So it's important that you continue to reevaluate and adapt as you're trying to address some of these plants, whether it's Japanese knotweed or Himalayan balsam or our myelin, any of them, it's important to continue to adapt. So in summary, wrapping up, invasive species are threats to our ecology, to the economy and human health in New York State, and it's something that um, you should all become engaged and uh, I hope interested in. Um, by engaging with your prism. So prisms are here regardless of where you live in New York State, whether it's the Catskills, the Adirondacks, Western New York, there is a prism available um, as a resource to you. Um, so we encourage you to become engaged and work with them in a variety of different ways. I, learning to identify and report invasive species is a huge help for the practitioners and, and citizen scientists and people that are doing invasive species work on the ground. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have an overview of the Invasive Species Management Plan steps, which again are outlined in this, this nifty little handout. Um, so keep those in mind as you're beginning to identify infestations on your properties and engage with management. And with that, uh, we'll wrap up and take some questions. I have a question. <laughs> and sure. That is, have you shared specifically which chemical is more effective with our local people down here at CRISP? I'm not sure. Have we? So we use... Um, so there, it's, it's not perfect for every situation, I'll say that. So we still primarily use uh, glyphosate-based herbicide, which is the active ingredient in, in Roundup-style products. Um, and we also use a second product that we'll mix in as kind of a, what we call a kicker. So it's a, it's a smaller amount of herbicide that's used to increase the efficiency of the primary herbicide, and that is a, an amazepyr-based product. And I say that that's not appropriate for all situations because it is a little bit more soil active, so it's not approved for use near water. Um, and it is a little bit more, it does have a little bit longer residual. So the following year after application, I wouldn't expect to see as much vegetation coming back, native vegetation coming back as quickly, uh, which is why it works, it works better. It's, it's suppressing all plants, um, but you will eventually see recovery and hopefully not knotweed. Um, so that can be used as a great supplement in terrestrial sites and then for aquatic sites, we use Amazamox, which is basically the same product that is just approved for use near water. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions for either myself or John? Um, uh, one, one of the things that uh, in the last several years that I've come across is um, 
in talking to environmentalists, uh, um, um, especially uh, permaculturists and um, beekeepers. Uh, they uh, tend to uh, take uh, invasives as uh, being um, they, they, uh, as a mindset uh, and, and call them uh, opportunistic. Um, and they believe that uh, instead of uh, considering them uh, um, invasive plants, they, we should uh, um, see how we can work with them instead. And, it's their, and beekeepers uh, particularly, I notice that uh, because they, they're, a lot of them are from uh, Europe and Asia mm -hmm. that uh, are invasive here, uh, but bees themselves, honeybees uh, specifically, uh, are not native uh, also. So uh, they're eating uh, their uh, native food, uh, essentially, the, you know, the pollen from those invasive species. So how do you, how do you address that yourself? Uh, when you come I'm, I'm sure you've come across that. Uh, yeah. That's a great question, and that's funny. I, I had this exact, or this exact same point came up in a, a presentation th earlier this week, where yeah, because bees are, are non-native, that oftentimes they are, are preferential to some of the non-native plants, particularly Japanese knotweed, which was introduced to some landscapes because it supposedly creates a much sweeter honey when the bees forage on that that pollen. So uh, my answer to that is that. Um, I think you need to look at, uh, or you need to weigh the, 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 the benefits and then the impacts. And I think in most instances, for all of, almost all of these species, those impacts are going to significantly outweigh the benefits associated with those plants, whether it's you know, for beekeepers or aesthetics, which is perhaps a weak argument. I think the impacts to the environment in terms of reducing biodiversity, pushing out our native species, impacting habitat for wildlife, uh, impacts to the economy. So for Japanese now, we'd impacting infrastructure, growing through foundations, through roads, um, creating a maintenance concern for highway workers, and then you know, for some species, impacts to human health. I think, I think in most instances, the, the impacts or the, the drawbacks would probably outweigh the benefits. Um, and the, I think it's also to, important to, to stress for at least some of the species that we're, we can do something about them. I think a lot of times when people have that mindset, they think that they're just there's nothing we can do. They're so well established. They're here to stay, and that we can't do anything. And perhaps that's the case for some, but we do also have, we still have a lot of opportunities for action. So I think it's important to stress that. And if you right. have anything else, John? Yeah, I would just say it's thinking about it holistically versus, I mean, everybody could have their own little niche of things that they're interested in. But if we want to protect the ecology, in the economy of the Catskills, then we need to weigh, as Zach was saying, the cost and the impacts of, of a lot of these invasive species. It may, it's not always a clear choice, and we're making a value judgment about what we think is important. Mm -hmm.